we are all familiar with wallpaper patterns. If we look at a patterned wallpaper, we see a small motif, sometimes a bunch of flowers or sometimes a small toy in a wallpaper for a child's bedroom, and we see that there is a repetition of this motif throughout the wall. If we think about how the wallpaper is made, we can understand more clearly the type of repetition that takes place. The wallpaper is made in long strips and the pattern is printed sequentially one after another with a repetition going vertically. We then hang the wallpaper in strips next to each other and that produces a shift in the pattern from side to side. So the fundamental property of wallpaper patterns is that they are repeated by translations vertically and horizontally or perhaps diagonally. Now, wherever man has decided to decorate buildings or artefacts, the idea of a repetition of a pattern comes in. And so we can see these patterns throughout history long before we had wallpaper. Let us begin by looking at some of these patterns that have occurred on buildings in the past. This picture <coughs> is a picture of a tomb in Iraq around about the 10th century. This is the domed roof, but the point that we really need to look at here is the decoration of the pattern along this piece of the tomb. There is a repetition, there's a, a, a symbol here with three prongs with some crosses on, and if we look closely at this we would see that this pattern is repeated along the tomb. There are other symmetries of this pattern involved. For example, we could take a point such as this, and rotate the entire pattern through 180 degrees and we would see the same picture again. So one of the problems we might dis dis uh, look at in this particular picture is to see which symmetries this pattern actually has. The next picture is <coughs> a picture of a mosque in Cordoba in Spain where we see many different wallpaper patterns. Each of these particular faces here have their own particular pattern. There is what is called a frieze pattern along here. This is, a, so to speak, a, a one-dimensional pattern that is repeated, and there are many symmetries around this pattern too. Moving on to something less exotic, we have a very straightforward pattern here. <coughs> In fact, this pattern comes from my bathroom floor. <laughs> and I've no doubt that many of you will have floor coverings in your own homes where there is some such pattern available. Again, we can look at the symmetries of this pattern. We could shift the pattern sideways or lift it up, and if this pattern were infinite in all directions and I made this change, you would not be able to see that I had moved it. In this particular case, we have other symmetries. For example, if I took a point here and rotate the pattern around, through 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and back to 360 degrees, <coughs> the pattern stays the same. So we say this pattern has a fourfold symmetry about this point. There are other points of symmetry of this pattern. For example, here we have a twofold symmetry. If I rotate this pattern by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and so on, we see that in some cases the pattern repeats and some it does not. There's a two-fold symmetry about this point, but not a four-fold symmetry. <coughs> Another way in which we see patterns in art is through the work of the Dutch graphic artist M.C. Escher. Many of you will be familiar with his lovely pictures. Here is an example of one of his pictures of angels and devils which also exhibits all the features of a wallpaper pattern. Here <coughs> we see a pattern made up of the angels in white, this is a particularly good example here, and devils in black. And these interlock together to give us a repeating pattern. Again, this, has, this picture has a fourfold symmetry. If we think of this as the center of rotation, and rotate this, this angel would go to this one, this angel to this one, this angel to this one, and so on. So there is a fourfold symmetry about here. We see again a twofold symmetry about this point. I would need to rotate the piece of paper by 180 degrees about this point to, to make the pattern repeat itself. <coughs> 
and there is also a translational symmetry which is a little hard to see in this picture because it's only a small portion of the pattern but if you imagine this angel here with the head of the angel here gets shifted across to this angel here and likewise this angel here will be shifted upward to this angel here. As well as wallpaper patterns which are essentially two-dimensional patterns there are also patterns known as freeze patterns. Now nowadays we are accustomed to having polystyrene ceiling coving around where the ceiling and the walls meet to cover up the crack where the ceiling and the walls meet but it used to be customary in, in, in the past to have a freeze pattern this was a thin strip of paper that took the place of ceiling coving and again one has a repetition of pattern but of course this time the pattern is only horizontally there is no vertical shift let me show you an example of some freeze patterns <coughs> These are in fact so-called Japanese border patterns and they occur in Japanese art when they border a particular picture or frame of some sort. Now in this case all of these patterns have the one dimensional shift that is to say we can take such a pattern and move it horizontally a certain distance and the pattern repeats. There are other symmetries of these patterns for example in this one we could reflect this pattern in a mirror line about this point, that is to say we could turn it upside down and the pattern would repeat. We could also reflect this one in a mirror line about that point. We could twist the pattern like this and it would repeat. We could also take this point as a centre of twofold rotation and rotate the pattern through 180 degrees. Some of these other patterns have other motions. This is a particularly interesting motion attached to this pattern. Here we have what is known as a glide reflection. That is to say this particular piece of the motif is moved into this piece of the motif by an action which shifts this pattern sideways, the appropriate distance, and then reflects it in a mirror line which is horizontal. So the action in this case is a shift followed by a reflection. And then, of course, another shift followed by another reflection would bring it back to this, and the composition from here to here is just a straightforward reflection. And there are other patterns here. Now, <coughs> these patterns are essentially one-dimensional patterns. There is only the one translation direction. And when mathematicians analyse these, we find that there are precisely seven such patterns if we disregard the motif. Now, let us take up this point about disregarding the motif. From the point of view of designing wallpaper patterns, the motif is very important. Some people like flowers, some people like other types of motif. But to the mathematician, the motif is irrelevant. What we are looking for is the underlying symmetries in the pattern and not the particular motif. Let me illustrate this point with two more pictures from Escher. In these two pictures, the underlying symmetries will be identical, but as you will see, the patterns are quite different. So here is the first of the two. In this case, <coughs> we have white men on white horses. There is the horizontal shift this way, and of course the vertical shift. Interspersed with the white men on horses are black men on horses. And again, these have a horizontal shift, and a vertical shift. And we get from a white horse and man to a black horse and man by exactly the sort of glide reflection that I've just described in the Japanese border patterns. That is to say, this man on the horse gets moved upwards and then reflected in a mirror line where the pen is. So this takes this one to this one. If I then repeat that action, this one gets shifted up and reflected and comes into this one. So the basic patterns in this picture are the two translations and the glide reflection taking this to this. Exactly the same symmetry group is expressed in the next picture, <coughs> also by Escher. <coughs> in this case we have white geese and black geese. There is the horizontal translations, the vertical translations in each colour, and again the 
transformation that takes the white goose here to the black goose is a vertical shift followed by a mirror reflection in a line roughly there. So in these cases, the geese and the previous picture of the men on horses, the underlying symmetry pattern is the same, but the motif is different. And the mathematician is not interested in the motif. <coughs> how might a mathematician describe such patterns? And how many are there? Well, if we forget the motif, we can look at what is called a basic cell of the pattern and understand how that cell gets moved around in the paper. Let's look at a mathematician's representation of such a pattern. <coughs> Here we have a square, the large square, and a smaller square which is shaded. We could imagine this smaller square as carrying any motif we wish to put in it, and we can build up the pattern as follows. We can think of this green centre here as a point of fourfold symmetry, and we can take this square and rotate it first until it comes into this position, rotating about this point, and then again into this position, and then again into this position, and finally back to its starting point. So we have four rotations, this going to this, then to this, then to this, and then back to its starting point. So whatever motif we put in here, we get, so to speak, a pattern built up in this square. We can then take this square and bodily translate it horizontally or vertically. And in this way, we would then fill up the entire wall with this particular motif. If we did that, we would actually see, at the end of the procedure, that these points here, which I've marked in orange, actually would have twofold symmetry. This would actually give us a pattern where we could rotate this by a, a pattern, the pattern by 180 degrees around this point, and the pattern would remain the same to the, to the eye, to the beholder. So the mathematician then is interested in the idea of a basic cell, a motion like this motion, this little arrow here would denote that this side is rotated round into this side. This arrow would also would denote that this side could be rotated into here, so we could take this square and rotate it first to this piece, then down to here, and then down to here. So the essential features here are the centres of rotation, the orders of these centres, that's to say whether we need a half turn or a quarter turn in order to bring the pattern back to its original position, and the translations involved. In this particular example, there are no reflections present, no, no mirror lines, and no glide reflections. There is another more practical way that we can construct wallpaper patterns by means of stencils. And this is a very good exercise if you want to get involved in this kind of mathematics. It's an experimental part. You can try out different stencils for yourself and try and build up your own patterns. Let me show you the sort of thing I have in mind here. <coughs> we start with a blank sheet of paper and a stencil, which in this case has a letter F on it. There's nothing special about F except that it has no symmetries of its own. There would be it would be a mistake to use a letter T, for example, here, because then the symmetries of the letter T would interfere with the symmetries of the pattern that we're trying to build up. So how can we build a wallpaper pattern out of this particular stencil? Well, we could start off by drawing the letter F, which is our motif, and drawing around the edge of the stencil. We could then try to build up a pattern by reflecting the stencil across each of its edges. That is to say, we treat each of the edges of the stencil as a mirror line, turn the stencil over, and redraw. So, for example, if we take the hypotenuse here as the first mirror line, we turn the stencil over, and then we repeat the procedure by drawing around the stencil. We may then take this as a mirror line, so we would turn the stencil over like so, and then repeat the pattern, and perhaps once more 
you turn the stencil over like that. And so on. And there is the beginnings of a wallpaper pattern. It's clear that if I continued the pattern in this direction, I could actually fill up a square of this type. And then I could simply translate, or what it would amount to the same thing, simply take the stencil and continue the process in that direction. So by means of a stencil, which forms the basic cell of the symmetry pattern, we can, we can build up wallpaper patterns like this. And one can try and construct one's own stencils, one's own shapes, to see which shapes will provide wallpaper patterns and which shapes will not. Some will not, and some will do so. So that's a practical way of, of constructing patterns and understanding the symmetries involved. <coughs> when mathematicians analyze the symmetry patterns of wallpaper groups, they find that there are 17 distinct types. One of these is particularly simple. You simply take a motif, you shift it vertically, and you shift it horizontally, and that's all. You, you don't reflect, you don't rotate, just simply translations. That's a very simple pattern and is not even worth drawing a diagram for. The other 16 patterns are more complicated, and I can now show you briefly what these 16 patterns look like. I'm not going to dwell on this because we're not going to analyze this aspect, but, but you should at least see the different patterns that can emerge. So here is the first group. <coughs> In each case, we've drawn a particular basic cell of the pattern, which is shaded. These are the shaded regions here. And we've indicated by repeating that motif just how the patterns would move the motif around the particular paper. Some more of these patterns here. They can get quite complicated. The more reflections and rotations you have in terms of symmetries, of course, the more complicated the pattern is going to be. And one last group here. In this case, you'll notice, for example, the pattern is built up on a hexagonal shape. We can identify hexagons, regular hexagons in this pattern. In this case, we have squares and so on. This pattern is very similar to the one I've just described with the stencil with an F on it. This one you can get by reflecting and rotating. So there are 17 fundamental patterns in this geometry. Let's end this section by trying to understand the basic mathematical reason why there are only 17, or at least, to be more precise, why there are only a small number. Let's not worry about the actual number 17. I have a picture here which I hope explains the essence of the argument. <coughs> Imagine that we have a rotational symmetry about the point A. That is to say, if I hold my finger here and rotate the paper, the pattern would stay the same. Imagine that B is also a point of rotational symmetry of the same order of rotation. So, for example, these may be four point fourfold uh, centers of rotation. Now, it's not hard to see that if we consider a reflection in this line L1, this line here, followed by a reflection in this line, L2, that motion corresponds to a rotation about A of angle 2 theta. So, for example, if I wanted to represent a rotation of uh, 90 degrees, I would take theta to be 45 degrees, I would reflect in this line, and then reflect in this line, and the composite result would be a rotation of 90 degrees about this point. If B is a center of rotation of the same order, I also have available a rotation about B, which I can represent as a reflection in L3, and a reflection in L2. If I compose those two rotations, that is to say, if I rotate first about A and then about B, and this, of course, will be a symmetry which maps the pattern into itself, that will be equivalent to, to reflecting first in L1 
then in L2, then in L2 again, and then in L3. So writing R for reflection, I've written this out here as a reflection in L1, a reflection in L2, followed by a reflection in L2, and a reflection in L3. But of course in the middle here, two consecutive reflections in L2 cancel each other out. So the net result is the composition of a rotation about A and a rotation about B is equivalent to a reflection in L1 followed by a reflection in L3. That is to say, a reflection in here followed by a reflection in here. Now it's easy to see that a reflection in here followed by a reflection in here is equivalent to a translation of twice the distance apart. So if this distance between these lines is d, this pair of reflections is equivalent to a translation by 2d. Now, the essential feature of a wallpaper pattern is that although we have translations present, we do not have very small translations present. There is a smallest translation that is available to us. This means to say that in this picture, if this has to be a certain size, then these two points have to be a certain distance apart. So in this kind of mathematical argument, we can see that the absence of small translations implies that centers of rotation have to be separated, how they have to stay apart, they can't get close together. And so we begin to see this idea that the symmetries of the pattern get spread out at a certain rate, they're not accumulating, they're not bunching anywhere in the particular, in the plane that, that we're patterning. So it's in this way that we can begin to analyze the wallpaper patterns, and as I mentioned earlier, there are 17 patterns available in the plane. Now, let's look at another aspect of this problem. Let's change tack slightly and consider the problem of wrapping up Christmas presents. We take a piece of wrapping paper, which to all intents and purposes is the same as a piece of wallpaper. We have patterns, usually Christmas presents, we have patterns of robins and Christmas trees and snowmen and the like. If we try and wrap a book, for example, we find that the paper fits nicely around the book, except for the last end bits we have to stick down with sellotape or some such thing, but let's leave that out of the reckoning. The paper fits nicely around the book. But suppose we wanted to wrap up a football. We would find very quickly that the paper we had was not at all suitable, and that the paper ends up being crumpled and squashed around the football. But let's imagine that we could go to a shop and buy Christmas wrapping paper that was suitable for a football. It would fit neatly over the football, and it too would have a pattern on it. And the question I want to raise is, will that pattern be different to the pattern that we had for the paper for the book? If so, how and why? Well, it will be different. And the next part of this talk is to try to understand the differences that take place when we try to lay down a pattern in a different geometry. We're going to look at the geometry of the sphere rather than the geometry of the plane that we've just been considering, and we're going to try and understand how patterns fit together on the sphere, and we're going to try to understand how the different nature, the different geometrical nature of the sphere influences those patterns. So let's think back to the school geometry, and let's look at a picture of a sphere here. One of the things that we learn in school mathematics very quickly is that the angle sum of a triangle is 180 degrees. That's one of the early things we learn, it's one of the fundamental things. However, let's look on the surface of a sphere. Now, what do we mean by a triangle on the surface of a sphere? By a triangle we mean something which is bounded by three usually straight lines, if we're talking about the plane. Now the lines on the sphere, the lines of shortest distance between two points, are arcs of great circles. So we would regard a shape on the sphere as being a triangle if it was bounded by three arcs of great circles. Let's look at this picture. Think of this as the Earth with the North Pole and the South Pole, and the equator marked here. Suppose 
two people set out at the North Pole and they head south, as they would have to, leaving each other at an angle of 90 degrees. So this might be the Greenwich Meridian, this might be longitude 90 degrees. They both walk down until they hit the equator, they turn around, walk together to meet each other. They've then formed a triangle in the sense I've just described, a triangle with vertices N, A and B. They set out a difference of angular difference of 90 degrees. When they come down a line of longitude and then turn along the equator, they turn at 90 degrees. So here we have a triangle on the sphere whose angle sum is 90 plus 90 plus 90, 270 degrees, substantially greater than 180 degrees. So here is an example of changing to a different geometry and having some of the rules of the game change. No longer is the angle sum of a triangle 180 degrees. And in fact, it's possible to show in, on the surface of a sphere that every triangle has angle sum strictly greater than 180 degrees. This is something to do with the trigonometry on the surface of the sphere. And being to do with trigonometry, it is bound to affect the nature of the patterns that occur on the surface of the sphere. Another important fact we learn at school is that the circumference of a circle of radius r is 2 pi r. Let's look at this on the surface of a sphere. Here we have the same sphere. <coughs> this is the North Pole. Now, what do I mean by a circle of radius r on the sphere? Our geometry is just the sphere, the surface of the sphere. So if we have a piece of string of length r and we tie it down at one point and we stretch it and then move around, that describes a circle of radius r. So if we tie the string down to the North Pole and the string is of length capital R, that's supposed to be in this picture, this distance here, and then if we describe the circle of radius capital R, centre the North Pole, we bring out this here, something like the Arctic Circle. Now what is the length of that circle? It's clear from our school geometry that the length of this circle is 2 pi little r, where little r is this radius, because this is a circle simply lying in a horizontal plane with little r as radius. So what we found here is that on the surface of the sphere, the length of circumference of a circle of radius capital R is 2 pi little r, which is blatantly less than 2 pi big R. In other words, on the surface of the sphere, the circumference is less than 2 pi r. So let me repeat those two facts. They differ radically from the plane geometry. The angle sum of a triangle is greater than 2 pi r, and the circum sorry, the angle sum of a triangle is greater than 180 degrees, the circumference of radius r is less than 2 pi r. Now, <coughs> I've summarised these two facts in this sheet. <coughs> in the Euclidean geometry, that is to say the plane geometry that we usually learn at school, the angle sum is 180, the circumference of radius r is 2 pi r, on the sphere, we have an angle sum greater than 180 and a circumference of less than 2 pi r. Although I'm not going to do any trigonometry and calculations here, if I were to perform those calculations to examine patterns on the surface of a sphere, I would inevitably get led to circumference of a circle, angle sum of a triangle, trigonometry, all the usual sort of calculations. And these facts here would inevitably mean that the calculations when carried out for a sphere would be different than those carried out for the plane. It follows then that the patterns that I would get on a sphere would be different from the patterns that I would get on the plane. There is one other feature which is almost self-evident, too self-evident to mention, that comes out of the patterns on a sphere. A pattern has a finite area attached to it. And the area of a sphere, the surface area of a sphere, is finite. So automatically, any patterns that I produce on the sphere can only have a finite number of copies of the motif. 
axes in distinction with the plane where when we have the translations, vertical and horizontal translations in, in, available in the plane, the patterns are repeated forever and ever. There are infinitely many copies of the motif. In the case of the sphere, there can only be finitely many. Let me show you some fairly simple patterns that arise from tessellating the sphere in the way we've described, the wallpaper patterns on the sphere. There are some very simple ones which amount to rotating the sphere about these points, two-fold symmetry about here, and so on. <clears throat> these are of a particularly simple type. There are more interesting patterns available, which arise from the regular solids. Let's look at some of these. <clears throat> this is a picture of a tetrahedron. It's a pyramid. This is perhaps the easiest one to see. It has a triangular base and it's a pyramid built on that triangular base. We can try and put a pattern on the tetrahedron and then in a way that I'll describe very shortly, transfer it to the sphere. Now how do I make this transfer of the pattern from the tetrahedron to the sphere? You imagine the tetrahedron with a triangular base and three faces coming down to meet that base from a vertex at the top. And you imagine that tetrahedron being inscribed in the sphere in the sense that you envelop the tetrahedron with a sphere such that the four vertices of a tetrahedron lie on the surface of the sphere and the tetrahedron itself is inside the sphere. You now put a light source, if you like, at the center of the sphere. That will be inside the tetrahedron. And you simply project the pattern by radial projection, just like a slide projector, out onto the sphere. And this will give rise, this pattern on the, the, uh, on the surface of the tetrahedron will give rise to this pattern on the sphere. And this will be a wallpaper pattern of the sphere. We can do this construction whenever we can have a solid that we can put inside a sphere with the vertices lying on the surface of the sphere. Perhaps the easiest solid to think of in this respect is the cube. If we take a cube, it's quite clear that we can envelop this in a, in, the surface of a, on, in a sphere with the vertices on the surface of a sphere. So we have a picture of that. <coughs> this is the cube. We've put, if you like, a wallpaper pattern on the surface of each face of the cube here. We think of this cube as sitting inside the sphere with the the eight vertices lying on the surface of the sphere. We put a light source at the centre of the cube, which will coincide with the centre of the sphere, and we simply project this pattern out from the surface of the cube to the surface of the sphere, and this pattern transforms into this pattern. This particular solid is perhaps harder to see as an octahedron. If you think of this particular thing here as being the Horizontal, a horizontal square, this half is a pyramid based on this square up here, and this bottom piece is another pyramid based on this square. So this is like two pyramids stuck together, one on top and one underneath, this being the line uh, of division. We can also put a sphere around this particular solid, and it turns out that when we do, we get exactly the same pattern. So these two different solids give rise to this pattern on the sphere. There is one more picture of this type, and these are of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. In this case, we have a regular solid. The faces are pen regular pentagons, and three pentagons come together at a vertex. In this case, each face is a triangle, and one, two, three, four, five triangles come together at a vertex. Again, these are regular solids. We can envelop them in a, on, a, on a sphere, as I've described earlier. We can put a pattern on each of the faces and project the pattern out. And in both cases, we get this particular pattern on the surface of the sphere. Now, the really interesting thing about these pictures is that we can show that these are the only wallpaper patterns on the sphere. That is to say, the wallpaper patterns on the sphere arise solely from the regular solids, the five regular solids that we've seen. Two are here, and then there was the cube, the octagon, and the tetrahedron. 
There are precisely five so-called platonic solids, regular in every possible respect, and it is these solids that provide us with the only wallpaper patterns on the sphere. So let me summarize then by bringing back this chart, which was really the underlying reason why the patterns on the sphere are different from the patterns in the plane, principally because of the angle sum of a triangle property and circumference of radius r. These facts tell us that the nature of the geometry on the sphere is different to the geometry on the plane. The geometry in turn affects the trigonometry, and the trigonometry in turn affects the wallpaper pattern. Let us look again at the chart which described the differences between the geometry on the plane and the geometry on the sphere. We're concentrating on the angle sum of a triangle and the circumference of radius r. I have deliberately left space here because there is a third geometry that we want to discuss and to look at the patterns in that geometry. We can almost guess what should be filled in here. Here should surely be less than 180 degrees, and here should be greater than 2 pi r. The question is, is there such a geometry, and what does it look like? Well, there is a geometry, and it's called hyperbolic geometry. I want now to describe the basic elements of hyperbolic geometry and then, having done that, to try and gain some understanding of the type of wallpaper patterns that exist in that geometry. First, though, let me describe what the geometry is. This time, instead of the space being the surface of a sphere, we will regard the space as being the inside of a circle, a disk, in other words. Let me show you a picture of the geometry and the lines. <coughs> Our geometry is going to be the set of points inside the circle, but not including the circle, strictly inside the circle. And we will deem straight lines to be arcs of circles which are perpendicular to the outer circle at the end points. So here is one, here is another, a third, and we also include diameters of this circle, since these are orthogonal at the ends to the outer circle. So any such lines will be called the lines of hyperbolic geometry. Now, one of the ways in which both the spherical geometry and the hyperbolic geometry differs from Euclidean geometry is through the notion of parallel lines. About two and a half thousand years ago, Euclid laid down the axiom of parallelism, which roughly speaking says that if you have a line and a point not on the line, so it's a line and a point not on the line, there is exactly one line through this point parallel to the second line. We can see from this picture that that property does not hold in this new geometry. Here is a line of the geometry, here is a point not on this line, and yet I've drawn two different lines through this point, not meeting this line. I could actually draw many more, because any circle like this, and I could clearly draw as many circles as, that, as like that as I, as I wish, any of these circles would pass through this point and not meet that line. The same thing is true in spherical geometry, that is to say, the lines of spherical geometry are the great circles, and in, that, in this particular case, any two great circles must meet somewhere on the sphere, so there are no parallel lines on the spherical geometry either. Now, the history of hyperbolic geometry that we're discussing now is a very interesting one. For 2,000 years or so, mathematicians tried to prove that Euclid's axiom of parallels was in fact a self-evident fact, so to speak, derivable from the other axioms that Euclid laid down. And it wasn't until the early 1800s that mathematicians began to really wonder whether there was indeed another geometry in which this axiom did not hold. There were three mathematicians 
who primarily uh, who primarily introduced the subject of hyper hyperbolic geometry. They were Lobachevsky, Bolyai, and Gauss. I have some quotations here from some of the correspondence between these mathematicians. And I think it makes quite interesting reading. Let me, let me read, for example, what Gauss wrote in a letter to Bessel. It may take a very long time before I make public my investigations on this issue. In fact, this may not happen in my lifetime, for I fear the scream of dullards if I make my views explicit. So Gauss was obviously understood, and obviously understood the nature of the geometry, but was frightened of the, as it were, mathematical climate that existed at that time. The mathematician Bolyai, or rather two mathematicians Bolyai, the, the father and the son, the father was wedded to the idea that the parallel axiom had to hold, and the son was pursuing the idea that there were other geometries in which the parallel axiom did not hold. And at one point, <coughs> the father writes to the son, that's <coughs> you must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to its very end. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy of my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone. <coughs> on, the, on the other hand, the son was quite convinced that parallels that the parallel axiom could fail in other geometries. He, in essence, produced the model of hyperbolic geometry. And he writes to his father at one stage, another reason for publishing this is that when the time is ripe for certain things, these things appear in different places in the manner of violets coming to light in early spring. What he's saying there is that what happened then, what's happened in other instances, other times in mathematics, is that suddenly the climate is right for a new idea to be born, as violets in the springtime. And in this particular case, three mathematicians at more or less the same time produced the ideas of hyperbolic geometry. Let's pursue these ideas now in terms of the wallpaper patterns. We discussed, for example, the angle sum of a triangle. What does this look like in hyperbolic geometry? Well, here is a picture of a triangle in hyperbolic geometry. Remember that these are lines in the geometry. So a triangle is a region bounded by three such lines. And I have colored in the three angles of the triangle. What we know from Euclidean geometry is that if I were to join these three vertices up like this, and look at, so to speak, this outer triangle, that the angle sum would be 180 degrees. It follows, therefore, that the angles that I've colored in have angle sum less than 180 degrees. So in this geometry, as we predicted earlier, the angle sum of a triangle is less than 180 degrees. Now what about the circumference of a circle? Well, this is much harder and requires more sophisticated mathematics, and I'm not going to go into the details here. But let me try and give you some idea as to why we have a length in this geometry and to why the circumference of a circle is greater than 2 pi r in this geometry. This is our circle, and our space is the inside of the circle. I want to remind you that we have this particular sum, a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on equals one. Very simple infinite series that we need to know. So let us mark, let us, let us assume this circle has radius one and let us rewrite this particular expression in terms of the lengths of segments. We mark off a segment of a length of half, a segment of length of quarter, an eighth and so on and these segments will just fill up this radius because of this relationship. Let us now imagine that our geometry is such that these lengths that I've marked out are all of the same size. They don't look of the same size, but we're looking at them with Euclidean eyes. If we could put on a pair of hyperbolic glasses, we would see these segments to look at the same size. They would all look the same size. So in some sense, to our eyes, what remains a constant hyperbolic length is shrinking as we move out to the edge. 
if we take that sort of view of distance, uh, we, we can do a fairly simple approximate sum which tells us that the radius of a circle, the circumference of a circle of radius r is greater than 2 pi r. Let's look at the next picture. Let's, for example, consider the circle. Now, this is not the original circle I had. This is the origin. I've marked out a half and a quarter, so this is a Euclidean radius, three quarters. The original circle would be out here somewhere. This is a circle in the geometry we're considering. These two segments are of equal hyperbolic length. I've called that L, script L here. So this is a circle of radius 2L. If I now take this segment of Euclidean length a quarter and mark out equal segments around the circumference, all of the same length, namely a quarter, approximately, and it is only approximately, these will all be the same length, namely L, in terms of the new geometry. And let's suppose it takes capital N of these arcs to come all the way around the circle. Then purely from Euclidean considerations, that's the geometry we had at school, we have the circumference of this is n times a quarter, and it has to be 2 pi times the Euclidean radius, which is 3 quarters, and that calculation gives us n is 6 pi. But now let's look at the computations in the new geometry. The length of the circumference is n l, since we have n arcs each of length l. So the length of the circumference is n l, that's the top of this fraction, and the radius we agreed was 2 l. There are two such segments here. So the circumference divided by the radius is n l over 2 l, which is n over 2, which is 3 pi, which is greater than 2 pi. So if I multiply by the radius here, the circumference is greater than 2 pi times the radius. Well, that's only a very approximate calculation, but it does show that this geometry has the type of properties that I was predicting a minute ago. Let's return for a minute back to the previous slide to recap on what we mean by the length in this geometry. We've agreed that the length in the geometry is such that these segments have equal length. So if we wish to create a wallpaper pattern in this geometry, any motif that we see here will, with our Euclidean eyes, appear to be shrunk as we move out to the edge. Once again, the Dutch artist Escher has produced some glorious pictures of such wallpaper patterns, and the next slide is perhaps the most famous of all of his pictures, again, the devils and the angels. <coughs> so here we see a wallpaper pattern in this new geometry. We have here a threefold symmetry. I could rotate this picture by a third of a full turn and the picture would look the same. All of these angels are the same size in this geometry, they look smaller at the edge because, as I say, we have Euclidean eyes. The angels gradually drift out to the edge, as do the devils, <coughs> and this picture is entirely homogeneous when viewed from the point of view of this new geometry. Now, there are many patterns that one has in this geometry, many more. In fact, there are infinitely many wallpaper patterns in this geometry, and it's not too di difficult to see why that is the case. <clears throat> because the circumference of a circle of radius r is greater than 2 pi r, in fact, if one is a little more careful, it grows very much more rapidly than 2 pi r. It grows exponentially fast, like e to the r, for those of you that know what that means. It means, in effect, that there is very much more room available out near the boundary, so to speak, out at infinity. Space the size of the space, in some sense, grows rapidly as you move away from the origin. And it's this rapid growth of area which enables you to fit a greater variety of patterns into the picture. So in this particular geometry, there are infinitely many patterns possible. Let me now show you some of the more formalized mathematical patterns that can arise in this geometry. That's to say, forgetting the motif, 
forgetting the beauty of the angels and devils, and just simply looking at the mathematical symmetry that's involved. So let's now look at some of these patterns. First one is a pattern by triangles, white and shaded. This has a eight-fold, I think, symmetry around this point. I mean, no, seven-fold symmetry around this point. <coughs> From the point of view of this geometry, if you lived in this space, that point would be the same as that point, the same as that point, the same as that point, and so on. Remember that as we move out to the edge, the distortion that takes place is a distortion due to our way of looking at things rather than the intrinsic nature of the geometry. A much simpler pattern, and a pattern which lays claim to be the most important wallpaper pattern of all, in all geometries, is this one. <clears throat> here we have a triangle. It's these sides here are straight lines in the geometry as we've described. And what we're doing is reflecting this triangle across this line. So this black triangle will reflect across this line in this geometry. This is to regard it as a mirror line in this particular geometry. Likewise, this is a mirror line and we reflect across here this is a mirror line, and we reflect across there, and we continue to reflect. This is carrying out the sort of procedure that I illustrated earlier when I had a stencil with a letter F on it. I simply drew around the stencil, turned the stencil over across the side, and drew the stencil again, and repeated the procedure. If I were to do this in this geometry, and forget the F, just use a triangle, this is the pattern I would get. One important feature of this pattern that one should realize is the strange role of the vertices. Here, the vertices are really not points of the geometry. So in some sense, we have three lines here which bound a triangular region which do not actually meet in the geometry at all. No two of these lines meet. Nevertheless, they bind, they, they bound a triangle, triangular region. A similar picture this time based on a square rather than a triangle, again giving us a wallpaper pattern in this geometry. Here we have a square. Again, all four vertices are, so to speak, at infinity. If I were to take a square in this geometry and turn it over across one of its sides in the same way that I did with the triangular stencil, I would end up with this white shape here, which is a square, it's bounded by four lines of the geometry. Similarly for these, and then if I repeat the procedure, I get this sort of picture. So this is another type of wallpaper pattern in this geometry. Let me end by showing you a picture which in a sense summarizes all that we've done so far. <coughs> Escher was very well aware of the nature of these three geometries. And here you see three pictures of works by Escher. This is, in fact, I believe, a charcoal drawing. This is a wood carving. And this is a wood cut, a wood print. They all show wallpaper patterns of interlocking devils and angels. This is the first of the three geometries, the plane geometry. And we've seen this picture before. This is a little harder to see, but you can, you can imagine, or you can see perhaps there's angels here, there's a devil across the top, and more angels and devils lying over the surface of a sphere. And this corresponds to one of the wallpaper patterns that I showed you earlier of black and white triangles on a sphere. And this is the pattern we've seen a little while ago of angels and devils in the circle, in this geometry. So here, in a sense, you can begin to see the real point of, what, of this talk is how the different geometries affect the different patterns that take place in that geometry.